and to join me as we pray together. Father God, we're so grateful. And we're so grateful for all that you do, God. We're, we're grateful because you, you rescue us, God. At the heart of the, the story in, in Scripture, from what you're doing from Genesis to Revelation, God, it's all about the great rescue mission that you are on to save your people. God, people who at times do not even realize we need to be rescued. People who at times, Lord, do not want your rescue, yet and still your faithful and steadfast, persevering love comes towards us, God, like a freight train and yells at us and say, I am here to rescue you. And Father God, for those who are here today who need rescue from disastrous relationships, God, those who are here today who need rescue, God, from hurtful past, God, I, I pray that they would see that you not only love, pursue, care, but at the DNA of who you are, God, if I can say that, is that you rescue. God, people came here today needing to hear from you because they want to hear whether or not you will rescue them. And God, for the time that we have together as we go through your word, God, I pray that you would use me to speak a truth to your people, God, that they would leave here not just hearing a good word, but knowing that they have a great rescuer, God. And God, we just pray and ask your blessing over this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you have your Bible, if you have your Bible, look with me at Genesis 6, verse 5 through 9. Verses 5 through 9. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. It was a dark and gloomy day. The rain had already started. I was a high school student driving home. When things went from bad to worse, my windshield wipers were no longer working. I couldn't see anything anymore. And things were getting really dangerous and really scary. So I'm driving and I see these red glaring lights coming at me, so I stop my car. But then those red glaring lights turned into green glaring lights. So I kept going. But as I kept going, all I heard was honking and yelling. I had no idea what that was about, but in a moment of seconds, I knew exactly what that was about. Because that intersection that I was driving through on a normal dry and sunny day is a smooth drive. But on this day, it had turned into a flood zone. And so I'm driving straight into the middle of a flood. My car dies, can't control it anymore. And I'm freaking out, I'm yelling, I'm screaming, I'm panting. What's gonna happen? I'm trying to open my door, I can't get it open. Water is getting into my car. I'm thinking, God, is this how I'm gonna die? As a teenage flood victim who didn't heed the numerous callings of the passengers who were honking saying, hey, stop, don't go. The water is rising, I'm scared, I'm freaking out. So I give one last effort and miraculously I open my driver's side door, I step out the car, I lose my footing and now I have water waist deep. What I needed was help. What I needed was somebody to come and rescue me. And by the grace of God, this man out of nowhere comes wading through the water. He sees me, he grabs me, and he says, come with me. And he pulls me, and he pulls me over to this little Italian restaurant right next to the gas station where I dried off and where I called my dad who came and picked me up hours later. See, you may have never been in a flood situation where your life was at stake, but I'm sure you've been in situations in your life where you felt, God, if you do not do something, God, if you do not rescue me, I am helpless. If you do not do something, I am helpless. Well, you're not alone. For the time that we have together this morning, 
as we continue our series in origin through the book of Genesis. We're going to be looking at six through eight in a, ti- in a message that I have titled The Rescue of the Righteous. And the main thing I want you to get across today, if you hear nothing else I say, I want you to hear this. God always deals justly with the ungodly while he always provides rescue for the righteous. God always deals justly with the ungodly while providing rescue for the righteous. So we come to our our text today. And at this point in mankind, they've chosen evil and wickedness as their general preference. It started in Genesis 3 with the sin of our first parents. It continued in Genesis 4 with the murder of Abel by his brother Cain. And then in Genesis 5, we are hit with the hard reality that the wages of sin is death, where we're given a list of the names of the line of Seth, all who lived and all who died, except for Enoch, who God took. And then we come to Genesis 6, and we read the first few verses. Brianna didn't read it, but we're going to read it together because we see something strange, something weird, something that, you know, is often not really preached on or shared about, but it's in the Bible, so we got to address it. Amen? Look at verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. The Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim who were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Now, you're reading that and you're thinking, who are these sons of God and who are these Nephilim? Well, to be honest, we don't really know. Over the course of history, is really two options we have. One is which that the sons of God are the godly line of Seth, as depicted in Genesis chapter 5, and the daughters of man are the ungodly line of Cain from Genesis chapter 4. And the thought is that the sons of God who have their hope in God, that he would bring a promise where the son would crush the serpent's head, were marrying people who had no faith and trust in God at all. That's one view. The other view, which is the most common view and the oldest view historically of the early Christian church, is that the sons of God are demons, fallen angels, and that they're marrying and and, and having children with mortal women. Now, before you get all crazy, this is not anything new. Angels took the form of man all the time in scriptures. In, In Genesis, later on, Abraham is chilling outside of his tent, And these men come to him, they're angels, but they're cloaked in in manly form. And they come to Abraham, and Abraham does what? He says, hey, come into the house. My wife, Sarah, she's going to cook for you guys because they were on their way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But before they made their pit stop there, Abraham told them to come in. And then we hop into the New Testament. Hebrews 13, 2 tells us that do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Why? Because by doing so, some have entertained angels unaware. So regardless of where you are theologically, what you believe, regardless of what you think is going on in those first five verses, it's not good. It's not good at all, right? Because the verbiage that Moses uses to describe the infatuation of these sons of God with these daughters of man is not love, but lust, right? He says that they saw that they were attracted, that word attracted there means, can be rendered to mean good, and then they what? They took. Saw, good, took. Saw, good, took. If you were here in Genesis 3, you know exactly where I'm going. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Moses is using the same language. He uses Eve when she saw that the tree and that the fruit was good. She saw that it was pleasing to the eye, and what did she do? She took it and she ate. So regardless of what you think is going on, it's, it's not good at all. But then we get into verse 5, 
And we see that corruption has gone rampant on earth. Evil and wickedness is common day. Every intention of man's mind was only evil continually. Mankind was supposed to be made in the image of God, meaning they were supposed to mirror God, they were supposed to resemble God. But now mankind has chosen to mirror and resemble the serpent. Death is the only thing that will ensue. So what does God do? Look at verse 6 and look at verse 7. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land and man and animals and creeping things and the birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. So God says, I'm going to wipe out mankind. Now, God is sovereign. That's a big fancy word for saying he's in control of everything all the time. So when you read that and it says he regretted that he made man and that he was sorry, you're thinking, did God make a mistake? Did he need to hit the divine redo button? He did all of a sudden he didn't know that this was going to happen? No. What Moses is doing here, he's using what we call anthropomorphic language. That all that means is he's using human terms to describe God so that you and me, the reader, can understand how God feels. He's trying to explain God's profound sadness because the people that he made to mirror and image him have chosen sin, wickedness, evil, and rebellion. And God is grieved. But yet, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, forevermore, the scripture tells us. So not only is he saddened, but he's also angry. Because that phrase there, it grieved him to his heart, in Hebrew literally means he had indignant rage. He's saddened that the fact that man has chosen wickedness and sin, but he is angry that they have ridiculously torn apart everything that he has created. So he's angry at the wickedness and sin, and he's saddened at the choice that man has made. Ezekiel tells us that God does not delight in the death of the wicked. That is absolutely 100% true. And yet, he is holy, so he has to deal with sin and injustice. So he has to punish. He has to punish the evil and the sin. So what does he do? He, he says, I'm going to wipe out man. Now, the issue that I have typically when I hear people read, talk about Noah, the issue that I have is that most people have a PG, unbiblical, fairy tale idea of what's going on here. Because what they think is that, you know, God is this divine animal lover who's only a divine animal lover, and he's just a little bit upset at sin. And so he allows Noah to kind of mosey on into the ark with the animals and his family. That's ridiculous because that's not what's going on here at all. This is impending doom. This is impending Armageddon. God is saying, I am about to destroy the planet but I'm going to save one person and those seven people associated with him. What I, irks me more than people who don't understand the story of Noah is when they say, oh, that was back then in the Bible days. Things aren't that bad now. To which I will respond, oh, really? Last time I checked, we in this country alone murder one million babies a year and abortion, literally the definition of genocide. We demean and disrespect people who don't look like us, talk like us, or have the same skin color as us, and believe that for some reason they too are not made in the image of God as we are with our nasty racism. We choose to engage in this non-committal lifestyle 
to things that God has told us to be committed to, which results in this pervasive hookup, shack up, break up culture. We have a pandemic, a ridiculous amount of people addicted to pornography who are consuming it and who are distributing it, resulting in the so much so that the president of the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention would literally state that the reason why he can't get enough men on the battlefield to share the gospel in the unreached places of the earth is not funding, is not the fact that they can't learn a native language, is that they're addicted to pornography. And not to mention the fatherlessness in our nation, where According to the U.S. Census Bureau, one in three American children grow up without a father in the home, which is nearly approximately 24 million children. And then let's not forget about this ridiculous uh, uh, apathy towards any kind of submission to authority, where people don't want to submit to their church, they don't want to submit to their parents, they don't want to submit to their bosses, they don't want to submit to the government, which all of that is to say they don't want to submit to God. And then the often overlooked, but not by God, disrespect and dishonoring of parents. Where children, regardless of your age, regardless of how old you are, regardless of whether you're in the house or out the house, buck back, disrespect, dishonor, and as old as they get, as soon as they're old enough, disengage from their parents, ultimately looking forward to the day where they're old enough only to put them in a home and to wipe their hands clean with them. I could go on and on. We could take a pit stop and we could talk about euthanasia. We could take a pit stop and we could talk about homosexuality. We could take a pit stop and talk about the lack of biblical manhood. We could take a pit stop and talk about the lack of biblical womanhood. What I'm trying to say is things right now are as bad, if not worse, as they were back then. And yet and still, in the midst of all the darkness, which brings me to my first point, in the midst of all the darkness, in the midst of all the wickedness, God, in the midst of all the darkness, knows how to find the light. God, in the midst of all the darkness, knows how to find the light. Look at verse, look at verse 8 and verse 9. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. In the midst of all that wickedness, all that darkness, God still knew how to find one righteous man. Now, don't get it, don't get it misunderstood. He's not a perfect man, and so don't think that he's perfect, so God found favor in him. What is going on here, Noah had his hope in the promise that God would do what he said he would do in Genesis 3, that he would crush the head of the serpent. So Noah is believing that he has faith in God, and that faith that he has in God transforms the way he lives in a godless and broken and crooked generation. Listen to Hebrews 11, 11, 7. Listen to how in Hebrews 11, 7, the writer of Hebrews describes Noah. So you don't think I'm making this up. By faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah had faith in God. In the midst of a dark and broken generation. And that word righteousness, because when the Bible speaks about righteousness, it's two ways. One, righteousness that you get from God, that he gives to you. The other is the way in which you relate to other people. So literally, he had a right standing among other people who were filled with wickedness, evil, and corruption. So God says, hey, Noah, I'm going to destroy the world, but I'm going to save you. Because you seem to be the only one who trusts in me. And so God tells them, I want you to build this ark. I want you to bring these animals in. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. This is a high calling. He's like, this is ridiculous. God, me? So what is Noah going to do? Look down to verse 22. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. What did he do? He obeyed. It's, it's, it's almost a foreign 
foreign concept. He believed in God, and so he obeyed. Notice the obedience comes after the belief. The reason why for many, an idea of following and living in accordance to the love of God, the holiness of God, trusting in what he's done. The reason why for many, like in Noah's day, they rather enjoy wickedness, I believe is because they don't believe God is actually going to judge at the end of the day. Which brings us to our second point. God always deals with and punishes the ungodly. God always punishes the ungodly. Look at chapter 7, <coughs> verse 11 through 16. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventh day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. And rain fell upon the earth forty days, forty nights, and every and the very same day Noah and his sons Shem and Ham and Japheth and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God had commanded. And the Lord shut him in. Now, what's going on? The purge has begun, right? Judgment is bringing on, bring upon the earth. God is bringing down judgment. And he tells Noah, I'm going to save you, your family. Now, up to this point, we have no idea about the character, the spiritual capacity of his wife and kids. I find that interesting. That... God says, I'm going to save you, and they, because of their relationship with you, and if they obey and they go in the ark with you, they get saved too. Remember, Noah was the righteous one. We don't hear nothing about his wife and kids, but they're saved as well. God says, I'm going to save you, Noah, and because of their relationship with you, their connection with you, they get saved as well. Now, the original readers of this, they would have understood exactly what's going on here because what God is saying is, you're going to get into the ark, I'm going to close it up, and rain is going to come upon the earth and it's going to flood the earth. But it's going to pass over you. We know that Moses wrote Genesis and his audience were the Israelites. When they heard this, they would have thought, oh my goodness, this reminds me of what God did to us in Exodus chapter 12 in the Passover, where God tells, Mo, God tells Moses, excuse me, he says, hey, I see the, that our people, that my people, the Israelites, they've been enslaved and they need help and they need deliverance. They need a rescue. So here's what I'm going to do. Tell them to get a lamb, slay the lamb, take the blood of the lamb, put it on the doorpost because I'm about to execute judgment on the Egyptians. I'm about to execute judgment and wrath on the Egyptians. But if blood is on your doorpost, I'm going to pass over your house. Not just your house, but everybody in that household. Surely those kids in those Israelites' home were crazy. Surely those kids in those Israelites' home had some issues. Maybe even some of the wives, maybe even some of the husbands. But as long as they were in the house, as long as they were in the house, God would pass over them. What God is trying to communicate with Noah and saving his family, even though he was the righteous one, he's saying that I am not only about saving individually, although your salvation with God is based upon your faith in him, not your families, not your grandmothers, not your friend, but also he's bringing together a community. Because your relationship with Jesus isn't about your relationship with Jesus. It's about how many people God can bring into his family. Now, if you're following the story, you realize we have two huge problems. The first of which, itinerant pastor and preacher, Dr. Robbie Zacharias, points out beautifully where you, he, like you and I, notice 
In chapter 6, God was extremely, extremely detailed in how he told Noah to construct the ark. If you remember, we didn't read it, but in Genesis 6, he said, I want you to build it, the ark, construct it out of gopher wood, make it 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits. One cubit is approximately 18 inches. So in our day, this is a battleship, 450 feet by 75 feet by 45 feet. He says, I want you to cover the inside and outside with pitch, which is essentially something similar to asphalt. He says, I want you to put a roof on top of it. He says, I want you to make it out of gopher wood. He says, make it a triple decker boat. Make a bottom floor, a second floor, and a third floor. Put rooms in the boat. Bring the animals in the boat. Bring you, your kids, and their wives, and your wife in the boat. Bring food so that when you're in the boat, you have food to eat. But what is wrong with that picture? There's something missing. And Dr. Zacharias points out, that God doesn't say anything about a rudder or a compass. Now, if you don't know anything about boats like your boy, I had to look what a rudder is. A rudder, for those of you boat connoisseurs, you already know, a rudder is how you steer and control the ship. So what is God saying? Now, God could have told him, you know, on the DL another time, but it's not in here. I think God is making a point. He's saying, Noah, you build the ark this high, this wide. You bring your family in. You bring the food in, but I'm in control. I'm in control. You don't need a rudder and you don't need a compass because I'm going to take you where I want you to go. Listen, that wasn't just for Noah. That's for you too. You're worried about how life is going to turn out. God is in control of the boat. God is in control of your life. But that's only the first problem. The second problem we come to is you, we realize, I told you, it's, this boat is about the size of a battleship, right? It's a big boat. So, that means there has to be a big door. Now the door is still open. And we already read, rain is already coming down. God, what are you doing? You told him to build this boat? The door is open now. The door had to be open initially so he could walk in, so the animals could walk in, so he could bring the food in. But what happens after they're all inside? Remember, Noah is 600 years old. He's not Samson, the strongest man in the world. Right? He's an old guy. No offense. How on earth is he going to close this door? What does he think? I'm, remember, Hebrews 11, 7, he was a man of faith. But you and I, people of faith, we also know that we're human and sometimes we doubt. So, text doesn't say this, but I would imagine that he's sitting there like, God, I did everything you asked. There's no way I can close this door. God, are you going to kill me with the rest of these people? The rain is, every drop of rain that hits the ground, he has to be thinking, God, are you going to come through? Are you going to rescue me? And then look at verse 17 in chapter 7, the most beautiful words in this narrative. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut him in. Noah, you build the boat. Noah, you're in charge of building the boat. You get your family in. I'm going to close the door. God is not only strong enough to save you. He's also strong enough to keep you. The issue that I have with people who tell me that they can lose their salvation, what they're telling me is that God's hands are too weak, that he has feeble hands. If he's strong enough to save you, He's strong enough to keep you in. The moment that God saves you by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, he shuts you in. For Jesus says in John 6.37, all who the Father gives will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Key word there is never. Now, if I have more time, we would talk about this beautiful marriage that's going on between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Because you notice, God told him to build a boat. God told him to make the ark. But God says, I'm going to shut the door. Noah was responsible for building the boat. God is responsible for saving him and his family. If we had a little bit more time, we look at Isaiah 38 and King Uzziah. He's praying. He's on his deathbed. He's about to die. He's praying. He says, oh, Lord, please save me. He's crying out to God. God tells Isaiah, I've heard his prayers, and I'm going to save him. He tells them that at the beginning. 
So we know King Uzziah is going to live. Then on the back end, at the end of chapter 38, he says, hey, put some boils and, 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 and patch, that, patch that wound up. What is he saying? I'm going to heal you and I'm going to save you, but you got to patch it up. I'm sovereign over the situation, but you're responsible for patching up. If we had even more time, we would go to Acts chapter 24. Paul's on his way to Rome. He's in a boat. There's water is tormenting. The people are scared. And God says, he tells Paul in the dream, he says, I'm going to save everybody. But y'all all got to stay on the boat. But as you go later on, at the end of that chapter, some of the people get scared, so they're trying to hop off the boat. Paul goes to the captain and says, hey, don't tell them, don't let them jump off the ship, because if they jump off, then you are going to die. God has said he's saving everybody, but everybody got to stay on the boat. God is sovereign. Listen, when the reason why I love this idea of this marriage between God's sovereignty and God and human responsibility, it means that, like you and me, I can't screw up my life that bad. Because I've, I've made some mistakes. I've made some grievous sins. But it means that even though I'm responsible for my sins, I'm responsible for the choices that I make, God is ultimately in control. And it won't be as bad as it could be if you're in Christ. Because if you're not, it's only going to get worse. This brings us to this idea. So we're, and this is, as I've been thinking about this this week, we're getting ready to share this with you guys. You know, it hit me in a real place because what I realized is the biggest issue is not the fact that, well, let me not, let me not say that. The biggest issue to me in the moment, I don't think was the impending doom. So that's a big problem. I think the biggest issue for, for Noah was the time on the boat. Right? Because the text tells us 40 days and 40 nights. When you see that in scripture, you, you know, it's always used to describe like a long time. But it wasn't just 40 days and 40 nights because we're told that the flood waters was upon the earth 150 days. So it's nearly six months he's in the boat waiting. Waiting. This is Oh my God, help me. This is interesting because he's all, the door's been shut and he didn't get hit with the wrath of the flood, but he's not yet across onto dry land. He's just in the boat waiting. I think this was the hardest thing for him and his family. He, he had to be, I'm sure when the door closed, they were rejoicing. But then days turned to weeks, weeks turned to months, and he's just waiting. The thing about waiting, whatever you're waiting for, is that it kind of feels mm, unproductive. It kind of feels like nothing is happening, but not to God. God uses waiting in your life to produce character, humility, steadfastness, and of course, patience. So what I think those crucial five to six months on that boat, God was Oh, help me, God. Because he was trying to take him somewhere. Along the way of him taking him somewhere, Noah had to become someone. Like, you're here today, and, you're, and, if, and the Christian hope is it's a, bigger, it's a bigger weight. Because we are in a position where we've been saved by faith in Christ, but we're not yet seeing him face to face. So we're in this middle part of waiting. The minor waiting, family, friends, job, waiting for test results, that just points to the ultimate waiting we have on waiting for him to return. Because, let me say, God is kind of like your homeboy in the neighborhood who has the pit bull, the Rottweiler, right? He has it on the leash, right? He has it on the leash. And what happens is, when people roll by your friend in the neighborhood, he's, arr, arr, the, 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 dog, the dog comes out, right? And what is your, your friend pulls it back. He pulls it back. He pulls it back. Why? Because if he lets it go, you're going to get destroyed. That's how God is with his wrath. Because what people fail to realize is because there's no floods happening anymore. He's not destroying the world, although I already told you the wickedness in our day to day is the same. He's pulling it back. He's pulling it back. He's pulling it back. But do not get it twisted. One day, as one theologian says, that great hound of heaven, God is going to let that chain go and that judgment is coming. And if you haven't placed faith in Christ, and on that day, there isn't no help. It's only impending doom. 
Listen to Matthew 24. 36 through 42. But concerning that day, this is Jesus talking about Noah. Concerning that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, there were eating, drinking, marrying, giving into marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware, until the flood came and swept away swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. What is he saying? He's not saying marriage is wrong, he's not saying drinking is wrong, but he's saying, like those First Corinthians 15 people who don't believe in the resurrection, right? He's saying, you're just going to and fro, eating, drinking, having a good time, happy hour, YOLO, and living it up. But when judgment comes, you are going to have no hope, nothing to do, nowhere to run, because you're not thinking eternally. You're focused on the here and now, not the then and not yet. Because when you focus on the then and not yet, it changes how you live in the here and now. He's saying, we as people of God, we are always waiting. But the beautiful thing about waiting, by its definition, it's not forever. Right? Waiting isn't forever. How do I know this? Look at verse 8, chapter 8, excuse me, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, which brings me to my, my last point. God brings salvation through judgment. God brings salvation through judgment. Chapter 8, verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock. Hold on, stop. But God remembered Noah. Somebody say, remember Noah. God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained. Noah was in that boat thinking, God, are you going to come through? And God's like, yeah, I always come through on my promises. He said, God remembered Noah. The, the great hope throughout the scriptures is that God remembers his people. Genesis 19, 29. God is about to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. But there's a problem. Abraham's nephew, Lot, is there. So what does the scripture say? God remembered Abraham and he saved Lot. Exodus 2, 24. The people of Israel, they're waiting, crying out to God for deliverance. Crying out to God because they're being oppressed by the Egyptians. What does God say? He doesn't say he remembered the Israelites. He remembered the person he made the promise to. He said, I remembered, God says, God remembered Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he saved those people. What am I saying? God always remembers his people. If you're feeling like God, have you forgotten me? Are you going to come through? You made this promise. The, is, the thing with that is, these promises that you think God has made to you, if they're not in the word, then you're just making up stuff. I believe God is, mm, that's crazy. I do college ministry all the time. And students tell me, man, I, I really believe God is, is leading me to do this. I say chapter and verse. <laughs> chapter and verse. And then when they push it, I got confirmation. What do you mean? Because some of you dabble in, you don't even realize that you dabble in mysticism. You base what God is saying based off a feeling, based off of something you've seen on TV, based off of things aligning in the right way. Listen, God fulfills his promises off his word. I'm not saying that the things you're feeling and you're dreaming and you're praying about ain't coming to pass. I'm just saying don't make that ultimate things. God remembers his people based upon his word. It's his word. So what happens? He says, he blows the winds, the water recedes, and then, so what is your response? I mean, imagine all this. I'm trying to get you to feel the emotional, like it's not just words on a page. You've got to experience the tone and the feeling and the emotion of the family in that boat. What do you do when you, what do you do when you step off the boat after everything has happened? There's only one thing you can do. There's only one thing that all of these events demand, which is worship. Look at verse 20. The waters prevailed, oh, excuse me, chapter 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every 
living creatures I have done. While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Noah builds this ark to God because he gets it. God just brought salvation through judgment. The key word there is through, not around judgment, not away from judgment. As Dr. Don Carson says, the same water that killed those people is the same water that lifted up that boat. God brought them through the pain, through the torment, through the trial, through the testing. I'm sure they, they had to have gotten off that boat, walked on dry ground, and seen nothing but dead bodies. And if Noah, knowing he was a righteous man, he would have looked to his sons and he would have said, this is why we trust in the Lord. This is why our hope is in him. All these people for hundreds of years, I was trying to tell them about the goodness of God, tell them about the faithfulness of God, tell them about this hope and this promise that's waiting. They didn't want to listen, but you are my kids. I want you to listen to me. I want you to hear me loud and clear. We, we trust in our God when we look like fools to the rest of the culture, when we look like idiots to the rest of the world. Why? Because he always deals with the ungodly and he always rescues the righteous. Always. And so he, he gives them this, this offering. It's worship time. Because that's what you do when your heart is so overwhelmed with the goodness of God, it overflows into worship. And it, and, and it says that it's crazy because I told you in Genesis 6, God used anthropomorphic language to describe his displeasure with man, right? He used human terms to, des to describe his, his, his displeasure, his sadness and his anger. Same thing again. Now Noah's using, now, excuse me, Moses is using anthropomorphic language to describe his pleasure with Noah's sacrifice. He said that he smelled it and, it and it appeased his wrath. God's anger was subsided. Now, he makes this promise that he wouldn't know any more, any longer, curse the ground, and he wouldn't destroy man. So we end on a good note, but not really. Because as we keep reading, it continues to be more destruction, more wickedness, and more corruption. Until a greater Noah and a greater ark appears. Jesus Christ, similar to Noah, lived among ungodly and evil people. But unlike Noah, he didn't escape God's wrath while others died. He took on God's wrath and died so that others could live. Noah's family were saved because of their association, because of their blood relationship with Noah. The people of God now are saved because of the blood that was shed by Jesus. They were associated with one man and they were escaped temporarily from the judgment that was coming. Our association with the Lord Jesus escapes us from eternal punishment forever. The ark was supposed to be a visible symbol of God's provision and God's protection for his people. Now the cross is that visible symbol of God's provision and protection for the people. They ran into it and were safe. Proverbs 18.10 tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. So Noah builds this ark. He makes a sacrifice and this is pleasing aroma to God. He had to give an offering. The Lord Jesus Christ becomes our offering, gives himself up as a sacrifice. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 2.15 that now we are to God a pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are perishing and those who are being saved. What am I trying to say? Regardless of where you are today, if you feel like, God, I'm living amongst evil and wickedness, I don't know if you're going to rescue me. I don't know how you're going to rescue me. I need deliverance. Let me assure you, the same way God saved Noah is the same way God can and has the power to save you. But you have to believe. Because remember, Noah had faith, and the result of that was the obedience. Many people think they have faith, and they look, and there's no fruit, and there's no obedience. And it's an indicator that there was never any real faith to begin with. You can't trust in yourself, try to do better on your own, work hard on your own. 
You need a... When I shared the story at the beginning, I told you about how I was at the corner of Hewlin and Granbury in Fort Worth and I was in that flood. Listen, if you've never trusted in Christ, you are not at the corner of Hewlin and Granbury. You're at the corner of sin and death. And you're not waist deep in water. You are fully submerged and underneath. But praise be to God that our God puts on his holy sanctified scuba gear and he dives into the sea of destruction and death. And he what? He rescues you. And your lifeless body, he has to breathe life back into. So what does he breathe into you? Not the same dark, corrupted spirit you had. Now he breathes into you his Holy Spirit. Why? So you can go out and proclaim to the world that our God, my God, deals justly with the ungodly. And he always provides rescue for the righteous. Trust in that God. Place your hope in that God. Bank your life on that God. Because there's a day coming when that great hound of heaven is going to be released. And that, and that wrath of God is going to be released. But if you are like Noah, covered. You have the blood covered over you. Covered. You're safe. Not just now, but forevermore. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we praise you, God, for the truth of your word and God, for the reminder that you save, God, you save the righteous. God, there's, God, there's people in here who are in here for all different kinds of reasons, reasons that they don't know. They were invited by a friend. They saw something online. They came to hear a quote unquote good word. God, I pray that you would show them that the need that they have above all needs is that they need to be rescued. We cannot rescue on our own. The power of the rescue comes from the great rescuer himself, Jesus Christ, who has the greater ark and who is the greater Noah. Lord Jesus, would you do what only you can by your spirit, by your gospel, by your power, save and bring to life those who are submerged in water, those who are submerged in wickedness, those who are submerged in themselves, those who don't even realize that the rescue that they need isn't from circumstances and situations. The rescue that they need is from themselves. They love themselves. They worship themselves. They want to make much of themselves. Would you do a miracle and rescue them so that now they can worship and make much of you? God, we need cross-centered eyes and a cross-shaped heart so that we can fall to our knees proclaiming to the world our power doesn't come from us, our strength doesn't come from us, our wisdom doesn't come from us, our hope doesn't come from us, our faith doesn't come from us, our grace doesn't come from us, but it comes from the God who saw us and rescued us. God, we pray and we ask in Jesus' name, amen.